good. Um, so today we welcome Luis Pedro Garcia Pintos, uh, who is at Los Alamos, and he will present to us some rigorous results on lower bounds on quantum annealing times. So uh, please take it away. Thank you so much. <clears throat> thank you so much for the introduction and also for the invitation. Uh, thank you everyone who's, uh, who's online. Um, and let me please apologize in advance if uh, it's a bit late here, it's been a long day. So if I'm a bit slow, uh, you know, <laughs> I apologize. And, and I, I'm very happy if you interrupt me with questions or anything. So, I'm going to tell you about this uh, very recent uh, paper I will put in the archive. Um, so this is joint work with uh, Lucas Brady, who, who used to be a, a postdoc at NIST and, and Maryland. We used to share an office with Lucas. Now he's at uh, NASA Ames. And also joint work with uh, Chuck Brinford. She's a, a PhD student at Maryland. And with uh, Yi Kai Liu, she's a fellow at um, NIST and uh, Maryland. And I, so I, was, I used to be at Maryland. I moved to Los Alamos. Um, a few months ago. So let me give you the brief outline of the talk. So I'm going to start by, by presenting the setting and the notation, the, I'm presenting the problem that we're going to study related to quantum annealing. Then I'll move on to, to give a, a brief overview of the ideas and maybe tools that we'll use in order to study annealing. Uh, so this is the speed limits uh, field. This is going to be mostly introductory. And then I'll end up with a main result on, on deriving lower bounds on how fast you can do annealing. So uh, to understand the last part, you don't really need to follow the details of, of the speed limits, but I think it's nice to present uh, you know, a historical view of, of, uh, of what uh, these ideas are. So quantum annealing, uh, the idea, and you all of course know it very well better than me, but the idea is that uh, we're going to consider a system that starts in a state, in an easy to prepare state. And the aim of the process is to drive the system to some target state that encodes uh, the solution to a problem of interest, maybe a, an optimization of problem or, or something like that. So what we're going to have in mind is a situation where we have a, a Hamiltonian H0 and we start uh, with a system that's in an eigenstate of this Hamiltonian H0, that will be this initial starting point. Uh, we have lots of generality. We'll assume that the ground states are, are uh, with energy zero. And then the aim is to drive the system to some eigen, the ground state of a Hamiltonian H1 uh, in some final time uh, TF. And we're going to consider the simplest uh, kind of setting where we just have only these two Hamiltonians and we have a single schedule, this function G, that is going to go from uh, zero at time zero to a value one at the final time. And the aim is to have a system that ends up as close as possible to this ground state of H1. So if I, if I, you know, I think of this in terms of the spectrum of a Hamiltonian, then very, in very simple terms, the, the, the hope is to start from an eigenstate, the minimum eigenstate of a Hamiltonian H at time zero, and end up in the minimum energy state of this uh, final Hamilton. So something very important in this field is to, to, you know, we can lean on the adiabatic theorem. So the adiabatic theorem tells us that if we do this process with this uh, schedule carefully enough, and in particular, if we go slowly enough, then the system will end up close to the ground state of the desired uh, Hamiltonian. So uh, more specifically, there are conditions on the time scale such that if you if the time scale is long enough and, and particularly long enough is defined by the minimum gap of the between the ground and excited energy states, then uh, your final state will be close to the, the state that you desire. So basically the idea is that you know the, the adiabatic theorem tells you that in principle you can go and remain close to the instantaneous ground state with very high probability and end up uh, where you want to go. So one way to say this is that the adiabatic theorem gives you, like it's it's quite powerful because it gives you, it tells you that you can do it, that you can do annealing. So there's some sufficient condition on the time scales that ensure uh, that annealing happens. Another the starting the starting point of uh, of our work is to know that annealing doesn't always need to be adiabatic 
even though this is a very powerful condition because you can ensure certain things can happen, in principle, you can do annealing in time scales that are a lot shorter than what the adiabatic theorem tells you. And then the question that we started studying with, with Lucas Brady is how fast can this annealing be? What's the fastest that diabatic annealing uh, could happen? And this is the main, the main question that we will uh, focus on. And with this, I, I connect, uh, you know, I present in a way that it connects very well with this idea of this uh, field of uh, quantum speed limits that has been uh, uh, studied a lot. I'm going to now briefly go over uh, these ideas of uh, speed limits. Sorry, I'm not slowing down. There's lots of noise outside. That's from the, the vice president when she goes <laughs> through. <laughs> There's a motorcade that does a lot of noise. I don't know if you can hear it. Quantum speed limits, yeah. So the idea of quantum speed limits is extremely simple, is to derive a bound on the speed of evolution of a quantum system, a bound on how fast a system can evolve. And the first of these bounds uh, were derived by, by Manuel Samantam in this paper in 1945. And let me briefly go over what they obtained. They considered the simplest setting of an isolated quantum system with a Hamiltonian H. And they focused on the expectation value of some observable A, of some quantity A. So you have your expectation value. And what they showed is that the rate of change of this expectation value is upper bounded by a product of standard deviations, where the relevant quantities here is the standard deviation of your Hamiltonian, so your uncertainty in energy, and the standard deviation of the quantity that you care about. It's the standard deviation in, in your observer. So if you know if here I plot possible values of A and the probability that these possible values uh, happen, this is the expectation value, let's say, and this is the width, then what they showed is that there is a, a, um, a constraint on the speed with which the mean can change. This constraint uh, is defined by, is determined by the, the by uncertainties in the quantities that are relevant for the so this is an uncertainty relation that bounds the rate of change of any physical process in isolated quantum system. So something that's um, kind of fun to think about, or I find fun to think about, uh, is this uh, trade-off, right? This trade-off between the quantity that maybe what you may care about, which is to have some process happening fast, and the trade-off between uncertainties. So if you want a process to be happening fast, the quantity that you care about needs to have a certain uncertainty, and so does the, the Hamiltonian. This trade-off is something that we'll, we'll get back to this uh, at the end of the, of the talk when we talk about that. Good. So this is the main idea of uh, speed limits. And you know this paper, it's an old paper, but there's lots of posterior work. I didn't put the data, I think it's from the 90s. Lots of theory work, and most of it focused on the idea of, instead of focusing on an observable and a physical quantity that they did here, you can focus on the state of a system. So you can ask questions like, how long does it take for the state of my system to evolve to some orthogonal state? So then you can derive bounds on this. Uh, and in some of these bounds, the metrics don't have to be the same. So maybe it's not always the uncertainty in energy. Uh, in the Margulis and Levitin bound, there's different quantities appearing here. So just uh, for historical reasons, let me mention that some results that were important later on in this field were also focusing on this idea, on the idea of finding bounds on the on this rate of change of, of the state. And then these papers focused on open system dynamics instead of isolated systems. Yeah, as you know, Isolated system is, is um, uh, kind of a restricted setting and, and many times in practice we learn about open system dynamics. So these papers were quite important in that they, they extended the, the, the regime of validity uh, to open systems. Good. Now, recently we, we focused on getting back away from this uh, focus on the state and going back to focusing on observables. And this relates to what we're going to talk talking about today. But in this paper, let me flag it. Um, we focused on kind of uh, the rate of change of any physical quantity in the same way that Mandelstam and Dan did here. But instead of focusing on isolated systems, we focused on uh, open quantum systems. And in fact, 
uh, you can also derive bounds on, on classical uh, for classical systems as well. And just uh, you know the the the, the um, the exact expression is not important, but let me just mention that, um, first of all, that these hold for arbitrary dynamics. So they're very, very general, and they're also quite simple to, um, to express, uh, similar to the mandel staman tam result. OK, and now I'm going back to, to where we, we want to go. Because the fact that, that you can derive these very general speed limits that hold for arbitrary dynamics uh, kind of forces one to think a little bit of to wonder whether these bounds, these bounds may be useful. Okay, like I'm telling you, there's bounds that one can derive that hold for any system. Then it's not unnatural to wonder whether uh, these bounds will reflect the dynamics of an actual system, or maybe these bounds are kind of like you know completely far off from the time scales over which a, a physical system actually evolves, right? So, so you know, this is kind of a maybe, maybe a mean question, but maybe more constructively, this is the, the question I want to ask is, do these general bounds accurately reflect time scales of evolution? And this is something that I find quite interesting that in fact, these very general speed limits that uh, I'm focusing on are saturated in a range of problems uh, of very different uh, kinds of problems. Okay. And let me just uh, very briefly mention some of some different problems where the speed limits are indeed saturated. Yeah. So as you can see here, annealing is one, and that's where I'm going to end up uh, talking about today. But there's examples in thermodynamics, for instance, where you may focus on how fast uh, heat flows to a system. Uh, that's what we, uh, one of the examples that we studied in this, uh, in this paper. This was a classical thermodynamics paper, actually. And there it turns out that if you have a system that's in a given state, then heat flows as fast as nature allows it. Like heat flows as fast as the speed limit, um, the corresponding speed limit um, allows it. So an example where there's some regime of interest where this original speed limits are saturated. And there's other examples like open quantum systems, uh, many body physics, uh, even a, a, an example I like a lot in, in biology where it turns out that you can derive a completely general speed limit and it turns out to be saturated by some models that evolutionary biologists consider. And the, the example that we care about today, finally, we go back to annealing. It turns out that um, the speed limits that uh, I'm going to uh, mention soon uh, on annealing are also saturated by some soy models. So I think this is something that, well, I personally um, find quite uh, kind of provocative and exciting because you start from this very general de de derivation and framework where you can study the speed of change uh, of a system. And you find that when you explore different regimes, there are um, saturations of these very general bounds. Good. So that's the, um, the introduction of speed limits, the ideas of speed limits. Um, and uh, if there are no questions, then I will, I will go on to, to show the main results now. Well, uh, yes. maybe you will cover it in your main results, mm -hmm. but there is this mm -hmm. averaging for the uncertainty. And I was wondering what is the averaging over in this uh, mm -hmm. speed limit? Thank you. Yes, uh, I, I will explain that better um, soon. But in this case, I was just uh, saying this was just the expectation value of A, so trace of raw times A. So this averaging was over uh, you know, the quantum state of your system. Um, so expectation value of A is trace of raw times A evaluated at time T. Um, but um, <clears throat> I can explain better what, what that means in the context of annealing and maybe that will, that will clarify the, um, the confusion. So, um, okay, so now the, the main aim of the talk, we go back to the problem of annealing that I explained in the beginning. Uh, so we're going to consider 
this setting with this Hamiltonian and a single schedule. And recall that the aim is to go from an initial state uh, that's an eigenstate of H0 and end up in some eigenstate, uh, the ground state of, of H1. So this was the aim of annealing. And the question I want to focus on is what's the minimum TF over which you can do this process? So um, here's a little idea. And, and I think this goes back to your question. What I'm going to focus on, or we're going to focus in on is like, note this, um, we start with a state that has zero energy with respect to H0, but the expectation value of H1 is greater than zero because you start in an eigenstate of H0 and H1 uh, has a, um, doesn't commute with H0. Uh, Therefore, with respect to H1, you are excited. So this quantity is negative, right? This thing is greater than zero, and this is zero because that's our starting point, so this is negative. Our aim is to end up in the eigenstate, the minimum, the ground state of H1. So our aim is to have this to be zero. But again, because you left the ground state of H0, this must have grown. Therefore, this quantity went from something negative to something positive. Uh, and this is just, you know, all I assume is that the ground states are zero, which you can always do with all the subject matter. So, so this is this starts at negative, goes to positive. So what we're going to, or what we did is uh, in the simplest of our bounds, just consider this uh, very simple bound, upper bound on the rate of change of this quantity, yeah? This quantity that starts in negative, we want it to end up in a positive value. And the rate of change of this quantity is upper bounded by the norm of this commutator, where this norm is just uh, the, the spectral norm. So with this, we showed, and this is the simplest of the bounds, then I'll go to some more elaborate bounds. We showed that there's a constraint on the time scale needed to go from a state to a final state. And this constraint involves you know, your time over which you're going to do your annealing process. And this tau defined like this. This is the lower bound on the annealing time. So this expression depends on H0, H1, and this commutator. And um, let me... Like how do you interpret this, this quantity, right? Uh, I think there's a typo here. This should be a one, sorry. This is a one, this is a zero, and this is a one. So, you know, like we start with a, in the ground state of H zero, and this is a one here. So this quantity is some uh, positive quantity. We aim to end up in the ground state of H1. So this should also be a positive quantity because the, the final state is exactly with respect to H0. And you can read this quantity as a kind of a, an error term. If you ended up in the actual ground state that you wanted to end up in, this is zero because you ended up in the, in the eigenstate, in the ground state of H1. So this is an error term that is zero if you hit the correct target state. And this, uh, quantity in the denominator, you can see it as a kind of a, a speed with which you're, well, the maximum speed with which you can be approaching this target state. Please interrupt me if this is not, if I didn't explain this correctly, okay? Um, but the main important thing about this slide is that by using this upper bound, we're able to obtain a lower bound on the time scales needed to reach a particular target state. If this target state is the Hamiltonian, the eigenstate of uh, the ground state of H1, then this is zero, and then this will dominate the, the, the time scales of this uh, annealing, uh, bound on annealing times. So this is one of the main results. Another question, of course, is to kind of uh, you know uh, investigate 
how this time scale scales with some properties of my system, right? So what we did in this paper uh, is then study some toy models where we can evaluate this uh, bound on the admitting time. May, may, may I ask you a small question? Yes, please. Yes, I would love it. Yes. Uh, the, uh, yes. Um, this framework sounds very generic in the sense that H0 and H1 are arbitrary and the ex expectation value or the time evolution of the system is arbitrary, including the case with environmental effects, noise. So you are, you are aiming to reach the ground state of the finite Hamilton even in the presence of environment. Am I right? Uh, no, yeah, so so thank, thank you so much for the question. In fact, it's not completely general because one of the things that I am using is that the dynamics, uh, I probably should have written Schrodinger's equation, the dynamics is given by this Hamilton. So uh, thank you for the question. I'm sorry that I didn't explain this correctly. The dynamics is only driven by this Hamilton. So uh, evolution it's is- isolated. It's an isolated system. It is an isolated system okay, for this particular, yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay, thank you, thanks. Uh, maybe I confused with ex telling you about all these other uh, speed limits. For this particular case, I'm con we are considering isolated systems. Open systems is something we're exploring and it's very interesting, but, but um, uh, yeah, from now on, I'm just considering isolated systems. And in fact, um, in, in this speed limit that we derive, we do use, uh, this schedule. So we do use a little bit of information of the dynamics of the system. Um, so it's it's in in some sense, and that's why I had an asterisk in the previous slide. In some sense, it's a little bit different to the other speed limits that I mentioned in, in the middle of the talk because uh, we are using and we kind of exploit some properties of some con, you know. Uh, constraints on the dynamics, in particular, that there is a single schedule and these two Hamiltonians in order to derive this uh, very simple uh, and saturable speed limit. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, so thank you for the question. And then um, just a brief comment because just uh, in, the, in this paper, we also study at some point what happens if you have more than one schedule and more than and more control Hamiltonian, but I won't go over, over over it uh, in the talk, but we can also derive bounds in that case. But open systems is indeed very interesting and we haven't uh, uh, published anything on that yet. Good. So with that, now the focus is how does this uh, bound on the annealing times uh, behave? And uh, I'm going to consider two simple toy models. Let me start with the one that I like the most because uh, I, uh, this is very simple. And this is this uh, search uh, toy model that Roland and Surf um, consider in, in this 2002 PRA. So the idea here is you have the items on a list and you want to find a particular item. So it can be anything, but let's say you, know, you have uh, the cards and you want to find a particular one uh, labeled by M. And then what they did was construct uh, a simple Hamiltonian model where you can uh, perform search by doing any. So, you know, what they do is construct an initial state that has equal weights on all of the possible items that you're searching over. So it's a coherent superposition over all items. And you aim to uh, reach a particular one, let's say uh, labeled by M. And what they do is construct a Hamiltonian that has that M as a ground state, you know? Like the ground state of this Hamiltonian is M, the ground state of the initial Hamiltonian is this state where you're starting, and the aim is to reach this uh, ground state of H1, uh, which is just M. So uh, the adiabatic theorem and, and all the machinery of annealing tells us that you can reach this ground state by just using uh, a schedule like this, right? And what's interesting that they, they study in this paper is that, first of all, they find that if you just have a linear schedule, so if G, this function here, is just linear, it just goes from zero to one in some constant time, with some constant uh, slope, then the time needed to reach a particular target state is of order D, where D is the number of items you have. So the time scales like D. So now the idea here is that this is the same scaling you would get uh, if you are doing a classical search, right? In a classical search, you start to flip all the cards and it takes a further of the number of cards that you have 
for you to uh, find the, the correct card with a you know probability one half. And that's the same that the linear schedule. Is. But what Rodenser found is that if you have an optimized schedule, right, that they can construct, because in this simple model you can find what the what the gap is, then the optimal adiabatic schedule has a time scale that scales like square root of d instead of right. So you have a, a nice improvement in the time it takes you to find your item by considering an optimized schedule, right? So now I can, going back to what we did, you know, I can just, uh, because this is a very simple model, uh, we can evaluate all of these things and evaluate what the, what the bound is, our bound is, and it turns out to give you something that scales like square root of D. And the prefactors also look very simple. So the point here is, I guess, two, two different points. One is that this gives you a proof Although it was very known, but this is a very simple proof that this optimized uh, time scale that uh, Roland and Serf found is actually optimal. You cannot do better than this uh, time scale. So that's conclusion A. Uh, note that their schedule is adiabatic, right? Their schedule was always going through the ground state. Our, our result does not assume adiabaticity. So what this says is that. Even if you have a non-adiabatic schedule, in the roll and surf case, uh, a non-adiabatic schedule cannot beat a, an adiabatic schedule because a lower bound that gives the same uh, scaling as, as roll and surf's adiabatic schedule. So that's one, one thing. And the other conclusion, maybe more important for us, is that this very general bound that we, that we derive is actually searchable, right? We found, you know, I have this very simple bound. Uh, it's very straightforward to plug these things in and find that scaling, but it turns out that this bound gives the correct, the same scaling that an optimized schedule uh, in the Roland Surf model uh, gives. So this bound is satrop, like I kind of already alluded to. Good. So this maybe, is example. Yes. Maybe, once again, ask a, a small question. Uh, this, this is very impressive, but it gives me an impression that the only the commutator of the final and initial Hamiltonian gives the time scale with yes. irrespective of the unyielding schedule. Am I right? Yeah. So um, you may be as the proof of Roland uh, Surf uh, meticulously use the unyielding schedule. Exactly. So I guess I, I don't know how to. Uh, like, I think you can see that from different points of view. On the one hand, uh, it's true that this does not depend on the schedule. So it's even more surprising, and maybe that's why you're asking me, it's even more surprising that this thing that does not depend on the schedule gives a time scale that is the same as something that very kind of meticulously and tailored and, 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 and depended a lot on the schedule. Uh, so I think maybe that's where you're um, going at, right, uh, Professor? Yeah. So indeed, uh, you could see it as, as even more surprising that this very general bound gives a scaling. Yeah. And, uh, that's the same. Yes. OK. Um, uh, uh, you know, on, a, on just maybe uh, so, so I'm not being too, you know, overselling things, it wouldn't be surprising if in more complicated models, you know, you, you won't be so lucky, right? Um, yes. Well, okay, okay, thank you. Anyway, <laughs> it's very impressive. I should check the calculation myself. <laughs> so this myself intuitively. I, 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 of course, believe you, but I don't believe myself. Thank you. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> no, uh, okay, 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 okay. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for, for, for the question and for, for engaging. Um, I, I, I don't know if I have more intuition to say. I, I agree that it's uh, surprising. And, and again, at the end of the day, um, uh, we've only found toy models, simple toy models, where, where this bound is saturated. And in more realistic scenarios, then I wouldn't be surprised if maybe it has to work a little bit more in order to derive bounds, you know, maybe improve these bounds. But having said that, um, it's quite comforting that a very simple bound 
um, with few parameters can still capture um, this, this uh, sort of time scale. So, okay, thank you. And I'm going to go to one more model. Uh, and this is this spin ferromagnetic model. This is also a simple model. <clears throat> the idea here is MX and MZ are magnetizations along X and Z. Okay, we're considering N spins now. Um, and you know, you start with all spins pointing you know, up in X, something, and you want to end up in all spins pointing up in Z or something. Uh, the coefficients are chosen so that you know, this is kind of like uh, uh, the norm grows with n. So it's kind of like a, a, a correct scaling with n, where n is in our particles, and the, the ground state is, uh, is has an energy zero. Good. There's a little parameter p, a free parameter p in the spins for magnetic model. And the nice thing is that um, this parameter governs the size of the minimum gap. So this parameter p then governs the time scale that the adiabatic theorem will give you. Okay. So I'll, I'll show a, a reference very soon, I think. But I mean, there's many people have studied this. And then one of the nice things, I, I think, as a toy model, it's very nice that you can go a bit from uh, an adiabatic time scale that's quite fast to an adiabatic time scale that's exponential in n by changing this parameter p and effectively making the gap uh, smaller. So, oh, well, I guess I put a lot here, but here's the thing. Um, I'm just quoting one, um, one references, one reference. Uh, I forgot to write, but I'm pretty sure that this is for P, yes, P equal three. So I'm focusing on this regime where uh, for P equal three, the adiabatic time scale is exponential in N, but in this paper and maybe others too, they found that there are diabatic schedules now. So now I'm not longer, you know, focusing on adiabatic dynamics, but actually uh, schedules that uh, may be doing things much faster than the adiabatic theorem. And there are schedules for which the time scale needed to reach the, ground, the correct state is of order one. Okay, so a big gap between the known optimized schedules and this adiabatic time scale. And again, you know, because this is a simple model, we can evaluate or bound uh, the necessary quantities and we evaluate Bound, and it turns out that the bound for p equal three in this model also gives uh, a time scale of order one. Also, I mean, I'm saying it gives a time scale of order one, the same time scale that these uh, non optimized schedules uh, gave. Okay. So this is again interesting from our point of view because it's a, an, another toy model where this bound is saturated. Uh, and, you know, connecting to the previous comment, again, this bound is saying nothing about the schedule, but it captures something that some complicated schedule would, would retrieve. And something that's also kind of uh, satisfactory from our point of view is that this example is different to the previous one, insofar as the optimal schedule here, the one that would saturate the bound, is not adiabatic. It's a diabatic schedule. It's one where the time scale is a lot faster than the diabatic theorem. That's very different to the problem and surf model where the optimal schedule saturated the bound via a, an adiabatic schedule where you're always going through the, through the ground state. Good, and with this, I'm, I'm, close, I'm close to concluding. Um, so let me just, um, you know, a, a figure to illustrate uh, what's going on here. Uh, we've studied three toy models where optimized schedules were known. And what we've found is that in these three toys models, our bound and the best known schedule gave similar time scales. But there's a big gap to what the adiabatic theorem would tell you, you know? So the kind of the, the worst case scenario is you just go as low as the adiabatic theorem tells you. But the best case scenario would be given by, by our bound. And it turns out that for these three toy models, our bound matches the time scales given by some optimized uh, schedule. So, so we found that quite, uh, you know, we were happy with that. Good.
This is the last uh, so slide. While we're on yes. it, uh, can you give us some intuition into how this QAA schedule looks? Uh, I, and uh, uh, why does it work or anything like, yes, like that? Yes, the, yes. At the very least, I, I, does it use only those two terms, H0 and H1? Yes, it does use only H0 and H1. Uh, and it's alternating between them. I, maybe if Lucas is here, he can uh, remind me because I wouldn't remember out of uh, the top of my brain. But um, I don't remember either. OK, yes. <laughs> Uh, thank you. That uh, that helps because I don't feel so bad that I don't remember. So no, um, I I don't have intuition, but it's a, a kind of a, a simple uh, QAA protocol where H0 and H1 are alternated, and by just plugging in the correct prefactors on each of them, you just find that uh, you you reach you you have a time scale for the one. So uh, I don't have an intuition, but it's easy to check that uh, that if you click on the right H uh, QAA schedule, you, you get the correct time scale. Sorry, I don't know. I don't, yeah. It's late here. Too. If, okay. I remember, if I remember yes. correctly, the, the schedule is, of course, the band band type because it's QAOA, but, but they chose a very uh, ingenious values of the parameters in the exponent gamma and beta by choosing those very good parameters, they could reach this bound. Yeah, uh, yeah. If I yeah, remember yeah. correctly. So the yes, yes. Um, yeah, yes. Thank you. Yes, yes. Uh, exactly. Like once you have those ingenious values, it is to confirm that that this uh, gives you the correct thing. But um, yeah, uh, thank you. I probably should have refreshed this before before today. Um, Thanks. Okay. Is there a question? Let me go to the last idea because this is something that I, I enjoy a lot of thinking about. So I, I show the simplest bound that we have. But we have another bound that involves uh, the energy coherence, the quantum coherence of, of your system. Okay. So in this paper, they define some measures of coherence. This is one possible measure of coherence. This measure of coherence is defined by looking at the state of your system, subtracting any state that commutes with an operator of interest, and then looking at the norm and minimizing over sigma. This is a measure of coherence with respect to your eigenbasis, your, your operator age, right? So you know, coherence depends on which basis you're talking about. You focus on age as a particular uh, reference operator. And then this checks which state you're closer to, uh, where these states are all diagonal in energy. So if you have an, an energy eigenstate, this is zero because you know you can just uh, plug here the energy eigenstate, and this gives you a zero distance. So this is a measure of coherence. And what we show, there's a tighter bound that I, the one I just showed before. This tighter bound with the little asterisk that I'm putting here is a bound that involves all the same quantities that I had before, but it also involves a time average of this measure of coherence, where the C1 is, remember, this C1 is your coherence with respect to the instantaneous Hamiltonian of, of the system at any given time, and then you're integrating these over time. Okay, so just to be clear, this bound is a lot harder to evaluate than the previous bound that I showed you, the previous bound that I showed you does not involve this. This is harder to evaluate because it would require you um, kind of being able to calculate this coherence, which is already complicated, but also integrating it, which in particular would require you knowing what the state of your system is. So like in the in line of the previous questions, that would depend a lot on your schedule and everything, right? However, even though this is more complicated to evaluate, I think it's conceptually, I enjoy thinking about it conceptually. Because now you're saying that if, if coherence in energy is small, then this is a small quantity, and this bound becomes larger, this time scale is larger, all right? So for instance, if I'm trying to visualize it, what this is saying is if, if strictly speaking, what I'm trying to do is always remain exactly in the instantaneous ground state, I cannot do an EV. I cannot always remain 
in the instantaneous ground state, because otherwise this time scale would be infinite because this measure of coherence is zero, and then this time scale diverges. Instead, what this kind of insinuates or, or kind of tends to imply is that it may be better to build coherence in the middle, or at least if you have coherence in the middle, coherence in energy. So in my drawings here is, are supposed to represent that you have a coherent superposition over many energy levels, then this quantity is going to be uh, larger and this time scale may be smaller. So, you know, let me circle back to the, from these ideas of uh, speed limits and get back to this trade-off idea, right? Because here, you see, we're trying to go from an eigenstate of energy to another eigenstate of energy. And in order to do this fast, it turns out that you need to populate other energy levels. So there's this kind of trade-off, you know? If I wanted to always be in the ground state, this would take me a very, very long time. Possibly I can do it faster uh, by going out of the state I want to get to and then go, go, coming back in. So um, um, I, I kind of like this idea a lot of, of, uh, of uh, something that forces you to, to see coherence in some way as a resource, if you want, uh, maybe in a big, uh, big leap. Good. And that's the end of my talk. So let me just briefly, briefly summarize. Uh, I showed you that there are some uh, lower bounds on the times needed to perform quantum annealing. One thing that we liked a lot is that these lower bounds are saturated in the three toy models that we studied. And the three toy models that we studied are the ones where optimized annealing schedules were known. So they were the ones where you could with good compare are bound to an optimized schedule. And as a kind of, as a, I don't know, something uh, to think about or that I enjoy thinking about, there's this interesting connection between the time scale to do annealing and quantum coherence of your system, which is something that kind of forces you to wonder what will happen if you have an open system um, or things like that. And with that, uh, I conclude. Thank you so much uh, for your attention. Uh, yes, great talk. So we have some time for questions. And uh, uh, is there any immediate questions in the audience? So let me start then. Um, there is the, this bound that you showed in the very last slide. And mm -hmm. uh, I feel like uh, it's hard to have an intuitive understanding of this bound because uh, it seems that, uh, or it's hard to see what happens in the adiabatic limit in this bound. So presumably it still should somehow say that we can um, prepare the state as tf goes to infinity. However, as you explained, if we are in the eigenstate, then this coherence is approaching zero. Yeah. So, and because of that, uh, you get uh, a, a zero in the denominator, right? So, whereas for from the adiabatic theorem, we know that, well, the time scale up to, some, to prepare a state up to some error is actually finite. Yes, exactly. But that, that's exactly where the uh, my savior is, like you said, up to some error, right? So up to some error means that um, you're not exactly in the ground state. And, that, and this up to some error would be exactly what, what would kind of save this, this uh, result. Like um, if you ex expect error zero and always to, uh, to stay in the ground state, you cannot do anything. And this is what this coherence term tells you. But the adiabatic theorem also uh, involves some error. And, and if you try to take that error to zero, uh, I am pretty sure that you also get an infinite time. So the up to some error is exactly the kind of the caveat uh, that makes these two um, results agree. Uh, yeah. Right. So is there actually a calculation where uh, you use the adiabatic theorem together with this result? and see that, um, well, uh, it, this bound is indeed correct. <laughs> uh, well, okay, no, so um, may, I, I guess now that you're asking it, I would be curious 
to materialize what you're saying uh, in some way formally, but but I, I didn't do any calculation because proving this bound is a lot simpler than proving the adiabatic theorem. So it's it's uh, um, it's quite um, easy to check that the bound is correct. So it, it, it's correct. Um, and maybe there, but I agree with your question. It's a nice uh, thing to entertain. What what, uh, what happens if you force everything to be uh, adiabatic, for instance, would you recover the scaling of the adiabatic theorem? My, my intuition, my, without having done it, I would say no, there probably would still be a gap between them. And it's just that uh, when you, you know, like for, for sure, um, like this says that the adiabatic theorem will involve some epsilon, like you said, and the time scale would uh, grow longer as you make epsilon zero. But it's going to go, uh, you know, it's going to be a gap to this uh, bar. But thank you. Uh, I think it's a it's a valid uh, question. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's interesting. Maybe Lucas has comments on that because he's in the audience. But uh, okay. well, may I ask you another question? Uh, can you show me the? Uh, case of the p-spin model, the evaluation yes. of tau anir for the p-spin model. <clears throat> yeah. In this case, the anir time, tau anir, becomes of order one because both the denominator and the numerator of the same uh, order with respect exactly. to n. But in the case of the roland surf problem, only the denominator determines the time scale. So, which, which of the two uh, denominator or numerator is important depends upon the problem. The yes, uh, exactly. It's okay. going to be very problem dependent. And in, in um, you see, like in the Roland surf case, uh, this H0 expectation value of H0 and expectation value of H1 that should be here are going to be a further one because you have this identity. Uh, term right, so I have expectation value of the identity that gives me one, and then what the, and then what's left and what determines the time scale is given by this uh, commutator that turns out to be a very uh, small number. So that's how, how you get this square root of e. However, here and in some sense, uh, the time scale that you obtain from kind of more physical models tend to be more of this kind. Because here's what you can think. Imagine that H0 and H1 are, are kind of, uh, you know, a sum of n terms yes. of local interactions, right? Yes. So then you'd expect that these expectation values are going to grow linearly with n. Uh -huh. And then this commutator, imagine that you have local interactions. So then you have H, H1 and H0. They're only going to be non-zero when I have kind of neighboring spins, for instance, right? So yes. then this term is also going to involve an, a sum of n, uh, like n terms. Therefore, this is also, go, you expect that it's also going to scale like n. Uh, so so, so th this, this bound of order one sounds very generic for physical yes. Hamiltonian. I would agree that. Oh, that's that's yeah. that, that's that's very great, <laughs> surprising. So if you choose a very good annealing schedule, uh, generically, you may expect to be able to achieve this bound of order one of annealing time. Well, okay, so that is exactly the most pressing question. I would say that will be the first thing to study next. If I have a an interesting spin model with locality. And I do an optimized schedule. Is it going to saturate this bound or not? It's not really known. It's not. Uh, we haven't studied it yet, um, and it's not obvious that there's going to be a schedule that's going to saturate this bound, right? If there was, that would be, I would say, really, really cool. Because you know, if I go back to this little drawing, right? If I have a many-body, uh, you know, spin system, the time the adiabatic theorem will tell you something typically exponential in n for the adiabatic time scale. Like you argued, like we were just discussing, our bound is going to give something for the one, most likely. 
the fastest time scale in your system is given by you know one over the norm of the Hamiltonian because if you think about it, you know the maximum gap would be the would determine the fastest time scale so where each anything can happen. So that's going to be like maybe one over n. So our you know one over n I would have here fastest time scales possible one our bound most likely that's what's going to happen exponential for the adiabatic theorem. Where is a, a, an optimized schedule going to fall for an interesting many body system. Um, and I think that's not known yet. Uh, oh, maybe someone in the audience can answer, but I, I think that would be the most interesting thing to study next. What happens with a more, a less toyish model? Is it going to be closer to our bound or closer to no. adiabatic theory? No. No. It's very, very interesting and impressive result. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, that was a great comment, and uh, I guess uh, I would quickly uh, say a few more things before we wrap up. Uh, first of all, in quantum control, we know that, for example, to rotate the every spin, there takes a constant time. So if we had access to a local field on every spin, we could just rotate. And if we knew the state that we're going for, right? So the order one time is not surprising from that. Uh, Point. Uh, I guess what is surprising is that you are, don't have access to the to the local fields, uh, and in particular, you, you don't choose them. Instead, you're just using two very global rotations and some commutators between them to pretty much travel anywhere in your unitary uh, exactly. group. And surprisingly, instead of scaling with the size of the Hilbert space, it actually stays of order one. Um, yes, yes. I, I think that's a very, uh, yeah. And I don't know point. if in quantum control there is a result that if you have arbitrarily high bandwidth, uh, then your control time doesn't actually need to grow. You can just use those bang bang controls. And as long as there's enough time to rotate uh, to kind of the opposite point of the Hilbert space, if you will, then. Uh, yeah, no, there, but I think a... your your comment of, I mean, whether you could do it just with these controls, it would be, it sounds, uh, it would sound surprising if you could do it with just these controls, right? I guess that's the, the non- So I suppose a, uh, uh, a more interesting question here is that instead of one, you can get some dependence on the bandwidth. So if you cannot do bang, bang perfectly, then, okay. Uh, you will probably not get where you want to, and uh, the time that you will need to take will increase. So, and whether this particular bound can capture the dependence on the bandwidth of your controls or not is uh, unclear. Why is uh, can you can you give me some intuition? Why is the bandwidth important? Why is it bang bang exactly so much better than having approximate bang bang? Uh, well, supposedly. Uh, in the limit, right, when you don't have a lot of bandwidth, then in time one, you just have one real number that you're changing, right? Or, mm -hmm. and then as you have two time discretization points in your arbitrary waveform generator that's sending the pulse, right? Then you have two numbers that are changing in this uh, unit of time that, that you're evolving your system for, and, and mm -hmm. so on and so forth until you get a discretization that has a very small time step. Mm -hmm. So with just one real number, clearly you cannot get anywhere you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I think. And another thing is that uh, that idea of combining the adiabatic theorem with your bound is that more be more specific here. The mm -hmm. coherence can be uh, upper bounded from the adiabatic theorem uh, for a simple schedule. Uh, so essentially, adiabatic theorem exactly tells you what's the probability of being away from the ground state. Then if, if you plug mm. that upper bound into sure. your bound, you get some sort of lower bound on the annual time. I think I see what you're saying now. What and you're then saying is the that- The adiabatic theorem gives the upper bound on annual time. So it's interesting to see what is the gap between those two bounds, I suppose. Thank you, thank you. Now I understand it better. You're, what you're saying is I can use the adiabatic theorem to put a bound on this quantity, right? Yes, uh, yes. Because it would bound, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, yeah, that's interesting, that's interesting. Okay, well, with that, uh, uh, thank you everybody for coming and uh, uh, see you again next week. Thank you so much. Thank you.